So last night in youth, I spoke on a sermon that I'd entitled Unscripted Passion. And I wanted to make this video kind of recapping on that sermon and put it out here because I believe it's something that as people are going back to school, starting a new school, going to college, going to a workplace, even some people transitioning from workplace to workplace or just going to another day at the same workplace. And it was looking at the book of Job kind of in its entirety and talking about how, so at the beginning of the book of Job, Satan presents himself before God and God's like, from where have you come from? And Satan says, well, I've come from roaming the earth back and forth. And then God says, have you considered my servant Job? He is faithful and upright, a man who honors, uh, honors God. And Satan was like, well, of course he honors God. And so to give to context, Job has pretty much everything he needs. He's pretty, he's a pretty set dude. And he has a house, he has children, he has cattle, farms, he has servants, he has all of this. And Satan's like, well, of course he serves you. Of course he calls on your name. You've given him everything you need. He's had no hardship. Like you have given him a perfect life. And Satan was like, let me take those things away and see if he still calls upon your name. And God said, all right, you can take it away, but do not lay your hand upon him. And so basically don't kill Job. You can take his possessions and what he has, but don't kill him. And so Satan goes and does that. His, there's a storm that knocks his house down and his cattle are taken from him and his servants die, his children die. Um, if any of y'all are familiar with uh, Tim Hawkins, you know, it's a joke. It's like, you know, Job's wife did not die. So that says something. But no, that's just a joke. That's nothing serious. Um, but all of this is taken away from him. And in the midst of it, Job eventually kneels to the ground, tears his robe, lays on the ground, and just cries out to God. He asks God's qu God questions, but it makes it very clear in the book that when Job is asking God these questions, he never sinned by blaming God with any wrongdoing because he never blamed God for what he was going through. And it's very evident that he didn't think that God was the reason he was going through it. Because when his wife said, die and curse God to his name, then Job said, no, you foolish woman. He called her foolish. And so there's a passion that Job had for God that even in the midst of what he was going through, he still honored God. He still praised God. And even though he was asking God questions, he never said, God, this is your fault. You did this to me. You see, Job trusted God and understood, and you know that he did because God at the very beginning of this book says that Job is upright and a man who honors God. And for God to know that Job does that, I mean, God knows all of our being. He knows who we are. But Job in his life had to, have be, li had to be living a faithful life, had to have trust in God for God to be able to say that about Job. And I don't know about you, but I want God to be able to say that about me, you know. And I'm working on my faith every single day. And Jesus is changing and teaching me things. But looking at this book, I want to see this unscripted passion that there is. And so when I say unscripted passion, I want to look at this book from a little bit of a different perspective. When we look at Job, we see that he had this routine of things. His life was set. There was a routine. He was in it. And then when this happened, it disrupted his life and changed his life. Last night when we were in youth, we had some problems with our sound system. And we had this routine, we had this schedule we were gonna go on, we were gonna get there, we were gonna practice, we were gonna get ready for service, and then service was gonna start. And we got there and we were about to start practicing until we realized we had no monitors. They weren't working. And so, in that moment, it could have been easy to just say, well, our sound system's not working. We've done everything we could do. I guess we're just not going to do worship tonight. It could have been easy to shut everything down because that routine, that schedule we were going to go through was just destroyed. It was disrupted. 
And I'm not gonna lie to you. It was a little frustrating that we weren't able to go through that schedule we had set. It was a little frustrating, but throughout it all, we understood that it's more important that we worship God than whether or not the sound system worked. And it's an understanding that worshiping God is so important that we're gonna do everything we can to figure out a solution. And eventually God showed us a solution and we did it, fixed the problem, and we had worship that night. But even if the sound system hadn't worked, even if the monitor still hadn't worked, I believe within my heart that we still would have had worship that night, that we still would have praised God that night because God is greater than anything around us. And so looking at Job, looking at that little example right there, we all face storms in our life that is going to disrupt our normal way of things, our normal life. It's going to disrupt it. We have storms that come into our life, whether it's something medical, whether it's something familial, whether it's this whole virus is going around. I guarantee you, everybody has been touched by this virus at some, in some way, and it has disrupted the normal way of life for us. It's changed our lives. Now, it is our choice through that storm, whether we say, you know, God, you are still on the throne and I praise your name or to say, man, these things I'm going through are just too much. And God, I just, I don't have it in me today. And it's in these times where we have to lean on God and have this unscripted passion, this passion that doesn't follow a routine. But this passion, this love, this desire for more of God, that even when the storm comes, even when your life is disrupted, that you still understand that Jesus loves you. And we say, Jesus loves you, Jesus loves you, he forgave you, he died for you. We say these things over and over and over again. And there is a reason that we do, because if you can hold on to the fact that Jesus loves you, that Jesus died for you, that the victory is already ours, then you can understand that this sickness, you can understand that this family problem, you can understand that this virus, political problem, whatever it is, you can understand that it will not end in defeat because Jesus already has the victory and he lives in you and you have the victory in him. And I know that there's been people that have passed away because of this virus. And there may be questions going on wondering, you know, God promises healing, but he died. And where's the victory in that? If you have that in your mind, that Jesus loves you, he saved you, and you're forgiven, if you understand that you live your life for Christ, then it's also important to understand that if the sickness ends in death on this earth, that is not a defeat. Because that means that person now goes on to complete healing in heaven with Christ. These bodies are already temporary and death is already a natural part of the way our bodies are built. But the thing is, is that even if I pass away, I still have eternal life in Christ. And that's where my victory is, is in Christ. God promises healing. And when I go to heaven, I will be completely healed of everything. And on this earth, God can heal me of whatever I'm going through. He can heal you. But a lot of people look and they see that this person wasn't healed and they passed away. And they're like, God, I thought you promised healing. He did. He healed that person. It may not be in the way you expected them to be healed, but he was still healed of all his iniquity, all of his sin all of his whatever was coming against him he was healed of it and that's what knowing that jesus loves you that's what knowing that he died on the cross having that in your mind that's what that does it is a reminder that no matter what even if it ends in mortal death there is still eternal life there is still healing and there is still victory. That is unscripted passion. 
having passion when it seems like you shouldn't, still loving God when it feels like maybe you shouldn't, still desiring God when everything around you crumbles. And I ended with this last night, talking to these youth, they're about to go back to school, and a lot of you are, or going to work. Every day you go somewhere. You're surrounded by people who may have never heard the words, I love you. They may have never heard that Jesus loves them. They may not know that. There may be broken people around you, hurting people. And you hold these words of encouragement, these words of life within you. You have the word of God and they desperately need it. Even if they don't know that they need it, they need it. And there is a yearning in their heart. And if they aren't reached out to by you, they may be reached out to by the world and they may be driven the wrong direction. You see, God's love, we sing a song called Reckless Love. His love goes after you. Even if you're running away from him, his love still pursues you. So think about this when you're roaming your hallways, your workplace, your college halls. What if God wants to use you as an avenue for his love to pursue someone else? So this is just a small message. Everyone needs to know that Jesus loves them. Everyone needs to know that there's forgiveness in him, that he died for them because he loves them. And that they have victory no matter what.